Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the latest in the series of Flexible Space Association Workspace Wisdom webinars. I'm Jane Sartin, Executive Director of the Flexible Space Association, and today we are looking at the topic of B Corp, which there seems to be lots of interest in, in the industry. Um, uh, some, some workspace operators already um, have achieved the certification, others are on the journey, but I know lots of people are interested in, in this. Um, so hopefully lots, lots of information today that's going, going to be helpful. So in a moment, I'm going to hand over to Andy Hawkins of Business on Purpose, who is going to talk through all about B Corp. And then um, Mark, Mark Gregson, who is the CEO of Impact Working, um, one of the Flexible Space Association's workspace operator members, um, who is on the journey at the moment um, So he towards B Corp certification. So he's going to, to come on after Andy and we'll talk a bit about what Impact Working are doing. Um, if you've got any questions, please put those into the chat box and we will pick them up at the end um, with, with Andy and Mark. So I'm going to... Um, get Mark, um, Andy's presentation up um, and then um, as if by magic Mark and I will disappear and um, hand over to you Andy. Great many thanks uh, Jane and Mark and uh, good to see you all today. Um, the B Corp space is certainly a uh, an interesting space and a great space to be operating in. Um, so I'm just going to run through this presentation now. So uh, my name is uh, Andy Hawkins, and I have predominantly been working in the tech field for about 20 years. Um, I then uh, started my own tech consultancy and put that through B Corp a few years ago. Um, I got that B Corp uh, certification through in August 2020, put that out on my LinkedIn and was then contacted the next day by mate number one saying, Andy, congratulations. Can you give us a hand? And then within a month, I'd had five mates contact me saying we'd like a hand. And so that was how I got into uh, helping companies uh, with that B Corp space. Uh, in the three years since then, uh, I've helped 350 clients across a whole range of sectors, quite a lot of press and PR and marketing companies. Um, about 25% of my clients have been food and beverage. 10% have been recruiters and um, another 40% have been all sorts. But there has been a number of uh, flexible space companies that I've uh, walked this journey with. And so it will be interesting to uh, hear questions and hopefully we can provide some insights and information that will be useful. So uh, today's presentation, you know, what is B Corp and why does it matter? Well, um, when we go to the supermarket, we'll all recognize the fair trade mark when we're buying our coffee or tea or wine or chocolate or whatever it's a mark that we can all recognize and hopefully when we're making our purchasing decisions we know that there's a degree of provenance behind uh, that product because we can see the fair trade mark that might also be red tractor or rainforest alliance or, or a whole host of those but uh, fair trade is one of the most recognized but in business, what is there uh, in business? Well, we'll have 9,001 for general quality assurance, uh, ISO 14,001 for environmental, and 27,001 for uh, IT security and tech type things. And there's a whole range of ISO type certifications. But for social and or environmental um, certification underneath that joined up umbrella, um, what is there for a business? And that really is where B Corp comes in. So uh, what I really love about B Corp is a few different things. One of them is uh, that it's a verified standard. So lots of companies might be able to put out a CSR, a corporate social responsibility statement on their website. But frankly, anybody could write anything and uh, they're not necessarily going to be called out on that. Um, and you won't know, you know, if it's true or if it's been verified. But anywhere where you see a B Corp um, certification, you know that it's been externally verified and they've had to go through an evidencing process to back up what they are claiming. Um, there's public transparency, so you can go onto a B Corp directory and you can click into any B Corp's um, profile and you'll see what they've scored across the various different sectors and all of that is publicly available, and that there's also a legal accountability. So you can't just um, go through this and say, 
we want to be great let's get the badge let's put it on our website and then go back to our our bad old ways there is a legal requirement which will require you to report annually on what you're doing socially environmentally and um you you are basically uh, legally signing up to the fact that you will balance people and profit um, um you know you you'll 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 balance that uh people and the environment side alongside profit. So there's a whole lot of things uh, on the uh, B Corp uh, uh, journey that are, are good to look at. Currently, there's over 7,000 companies that are B Corp certified around the world in not over 90 countries, and they all work with one unifying goal, which is trying to use their business, not just as a profit generator, but also use their business as a force for good. So that is the one unifying goal that they all sign up to. Uh, in the UK, there's a whole range of different names that you might uh, recognize, Packer Herbs, Triodos Bank. Uh, there's a whole range of those. Uh, I'm also uh, based in Bristol and I'm co-chair of the Bristol and Bath B Local. So that is a meetup group for uh, local B Corps. There's 13 or 14 of those groups around the UK. So we meet uh, on a monthly basis to uh, swap stories and encourage each other, um, share best practice and hold each other uh, to, to accountability. So uh, there's a range of different names on there that you may well uh, recognize. And in the uh, flexible working space, there's a number of uh, flexible working companies that are already uh, B Corps and some that are working their to way towards uh, B Corp certification, but certainly that space is quite a vibrant space for uh, the B Corp standard. There is, as I said, this B Corp directory, which anyone can look at at any time. You know, just sort, search B Corp directory and you'll find it. You can search by country. You can put in keywords and actually search uh, to see who's out there that is a B Corp. But also when you're looking to find uh, other potential for good suppliers, then the B Corp directory is a great place to go and see if you can find those um, purposeful suppliers. So people ask me quite regularly, what are the main reasons why a company might want to go B Corp? What are the uh, main benefits that people will go B Corp? Um, as it happens today, uh, I've recently published uh, on, on my LinkedIn profile today, a piece of research that we went through with Bristol University, some master students that did some research with me this year. One of them looked at the benefits to becoming a B Corp, and another one looked at the barriers that are stopping companies from measuring and improving their social and environmental impact. So if you're interested in looking at that research, please uh, find me on LinkedIn, and uh, on today's date, you will find uh, some of that uh, overview of that research is published. But in summary, one of the things that is regularly cited is that becoming a B Corp has helped us to recruit uh, better and easier and find the right people. We all know that um, onboarding uh, the wrong people, people that don't match our culture, uh, is an expensive business. So finding um, good recruits is, is a great thing to do. And there is at the moment um, a challenge for some employers to find recruits. Um, there's a, a, a little bit of a um, lack of decent recruits out there in the marketplace. So attracting the best uh, people for your business is a great thing to do. And a lot of today's people that are looking are wanting to work for a purposeful employer. So finding someone who is a B Corp is a great way of indicating that as well as attracting top talent. Retaining top talent is also equally, if not more important. We don't want to bring in good people at the front end if we're then losing equally uh, people at the back end. So becoming a B Corp helps companies consistently retain their talent because they feel they are working for a purposeful employer who takes into account a range of different stakeholders, their suppliers, their employees, their customers, um, it's not just about what the boss thinks, it's, a, it's a really about creating a culture where employees feel they have got a valid and a listened to voice. So that is another uh, piece. One of the other commonly cited areas is uh, risk, risk identification, 
risk management, risk mitigation. So going through the B impact assessment, which we will look at in a moment, is a great way of putting your company through a framework that asks a whole range of questions across a whole range of different subject areas. And in going through that, there will be areas that you've not necessarily considered before. And in doing so, you can think about what your um, options for that particular aspect might be and put an appropriate policy and process in place and thereby manage and mitigate any risk that might come across that. And then last but not least, one of the areas that is again regularly cited as a benefit to becoming a B Corp is it helps us to attract new customers, um, you know, to sell more to our marketplace. Uh, people want to buy from purposeful organizations. So having B Corp on your front door is a great way of uh, just like the fair trademark saying we, we are one of the good ones, uh, please come and buy from us. We wouldn't necessarily say become a B Corp just because you want to increase market share. That would be somewhat disingenuous. We want people to go through B Corp because we want them to be um, purposeful about measuring and improving their social and environmental impact. But certainly uh, we know that uh, companies do pick up additional uh, sales because they are a B Corp. So that can't be uh, discounted altogether. So how do we find this sweet spot between people, planet and profit? It's really that sweet spot that we are looking to try and identify. And the toolkit that we deploy to help companies do that is the B Impact Assessment. So this is a free to use toolkit that is available to any company to log into on bimpactassessment.net. Anyone can sign in. There are over 7,000 companies globally that are B Corps, but there are uh, somewhere in the region of 50,000 companies that have used this uh, framework as a template to do a self-reflective look at where they are at. So we would certainly encourage any company to give it a go and actually uh, see, where, see where they score. Having said that, it is quite a uh, complicated process. There's 150 to 200 questions. No one's quite sure how many questions there are because there are a range of different tracks which you can select. Uh, one track is the service sector. Um, uh, the next track is retail and wholesale. That's got some additional questions. The next track on from there is the manufacturing track. They've got even more questions. And then last but not least, there's the agricultural uh, track, which has got the most questions. And then there are factors like how many employees have you got? That will also um, uh, influence how many questions you've got. And then throughout the questionnaire, there are a number of gatekeeper questions, which depending on how you answer, but if you tick a particular tick, that might then open up another one or two questions subsequently uh, through that gatekeeper question. But there's in the region of 150 to 200 questions. Uh, the threshold for becoming a B Corp is 80 points. That's the current threshold. And the uh, impact assessment is currently going through a revamp. And uh, the middle of next year, the middle of 2024, uh, there will be a new impact assessment tool that is coming out. And I'll talk in a little more detail about that. But for now, we're on version six of the impact assessment. But one of the reasons that that's uh, going through a revamp is Version six came out pre-COVID, pre-Brexit, uh, you know, pre-Black Lives Matters. There's a whole host of things that have changed over the last few years. So the new impact assessment will be taking that into account. And B Lab themselves have going, been going through an extensive consultation exercise to uh, chat to various different stakeholder groups to make sure that they are going to get that new impact assessment as good as it can be ready for its launch uh, next year. But as you can see here, there are a range of different sections um, that you can, uh, you can have a look at. Uh, they cover governance, workers, the community, which includes your suppliers and contractors, freelancers, uh, the environment uh, in which you're operating. Uh, do you own your building? Are you leasing a building? Are you in a co-working space? All of these things are looked at in the environment section. And then the final uh, fifth section uh, that you'll answer um, and get point scoring against that is the customer section. What are you doing with your customers? How are you engaging with your customers? 
uh, what good are you doing in conjunction with your customers? And then the sixth and final section is disclosure questions. This is effectively a negative screening section that you'll look at. Do you deal with the tobacco industry, the armaments industry, the alcohol industry, a whole range of different industries? And if you are dealing with those industries, then B-Lab will ask you for some extra questions. What percentage of your turnover does that particular industry account for? Um, how long have you been working with that industry and so on and so forth? So B-Lab are doing some due diligence when they're asking you questions in that sixth question, in that sixth section. So when you're working your way through the B impact assessment, there are a whole range of different phrases and words that you might not be familiar with. Of the circa 150, 200 questions, a third of them, you'll almost certainly know the answer to straight away and feel fairly confident about those answers. Another third of those questions, you'll think, well, I think I know the answer, but I'm not totally sure. And I wouldn't mind bouncing that off of somebody. And there'll be a final third of questions that you'll think, I really don't understand those words and what that might mean for my industry. So uh, there'll, there'll be a, a series of those things. And that is where someone like me as a B leader uh, will come in to try and help. So my, my job title, which I uh, self-styled, is I am C3PO, which stands for Chief People, Planet and Purpose Officer. And for those Star Wars fans that might be on the call, you'll know that C-3PO was a translation droid. So um, as C-3PO, I help clients through the B-Impact assessment process by translating some of those questions and hopefully putting them into uh, a format that you will understand and you'll be able to be more confident about as you're working your way through that. For example, what is an underserved people group? Uh, that might be something that you're not familiar with, but essentially an underserved people group is generally classified either by ethnicity or by socioeconomic or by disability. And is your business working in its upstream or downstream supply chain or indeed within your employees in any of those areas, in which case we'll ask some questions and you'll score points around those areas. So that's a, an example of uh, some of those areas that might, might not be quite so clear. When astronauts go up to space and then they come back down to Earth, they are always interviewed unsurprisingly. When they are interviewed, they regularly report two uh, similar um, responses. One of them is, isn't the planet a beautiful place from up there? And they're often emotionally moved to tears when they look back on planet Earth. The second regularly reported um, feedback is, why is it we, as a group of humans on this amazing planet, cannot do better to look after the planet with which we are tenants? And why is it we can't do better on looking after each other? never uh, it's never far from the news um you know climate crisis uh, wars uh, invasions challenges are all around the world and we as a bunch of humans could and should do better if not us then who and if not now then when how can we all use our business as a force for good that's the end of my presentation if anyone wants to get in touch with me, you can follow up uh, by, via Jane or Mark or the association, or you can drop me a line directly on uh, Andy at Business On Purpose or find me on LinkedIn. But thank you so much for inviting me on today. And uh, we'll now be open for uh, hearing from Mark, how he's found it as a journey and a few questions which Jane is going to field for. So uh, thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you, Andy. That was an awful lot of information packed in there and a really practical, helpful, helpful guide. Um, so, Mark, um, this is, you know, Andy talked about what um, what motivates businesses to um, want to become a B Corp. What what motivated impact working and yourself? Um, there's, there's a lot of things. How long have we got? Um, I think probably probably the main one for, for, for us was well, it's driven by four things, really. I think the first one was um, our tenants. 
we had sort of two or three of our occupiers were um, were pushing for B Corp or wanting to kind of apply for the um, for the certification. And I think that traditionally as an occupier, if you're in a lease building, you tend to be in control of everything, whether it be your energy supply or your furniture or all your purchases, or basically the entire supply chain. Whereas I think if you're an occupier in a co-working space, you really kind of rely on a landlord who's doing everything um, to already make those better choices on your behalf. So I think in, in order for us to um, provide a space that would help our occupiers achieve B Corp status, well, I think we kind of thought to ourselves that we can't beat them, we might as well sort of join them. So we decided to start the process ourselves. And this was, what, what, Andy, probably 18 months ago now, I would guess. I was actually introduced to Andy from uh, from one of our occupiers. So Andy's been sort of helping us through the journey. Um, I, I think probably kind of factor two, and Andy touched on it, is the fact it's, uh, it's, it's externally audited. So I think it kind of makes you more credible. Um, I think kind of these days, I think there's a lot of, um, not just in our industry, but in other industries, there's a lot of kind of greenwashing. There's a lot of wellness consumerism. There's a lot of um, disingenuity, let's, let's say, out there. And I think, you know, by virtue of the fact that we're externally audited, you know, you, you have to put your neck on the block. You are held to account and there's no escape in it. Um, and that was kind of really kind of critical for us as well. So it wasn't the case that our marketing literature was sort of saying we're doing these things. Um, you know, we've got Mr. B Corp kind of backing us up, you know, that, that we have not only kind of committed to those things, but we are doing those things. Um, I think one thing, um, I think one thing which is critical for us as well, and we're definitely finding out now, I think it's, uh, it, it's, it's easier to probably start the process and get stuck into the process when you're smaller as a business. I think as you tend to grow, you've got a lot of stuff to untangle and, um, I certainly couldn't want to, wouldn't want to be one of those operators who remain nameless with 3,000 buildings in 88 countries, trying to unpick that now and achieve B Corp status. Because I think kind of retrospectively, it's a lot more difficult, whereas being a relatively new business, so we've only been going two and a half years. So I think for us to get stuck in from the start, and to the start as we mean to go on, was probably another reason why we thought, well, let's, let's, let's do it now before we kind of grow and start, you know, start weaving a web, which again is kind of a little bit more difficult to, uh, to, to untangle. So they're probably kind of the key, the key ones for us. Um, and what have you learned along the way? What, is there anything particularly surprising that you've learned? Um, yeah, um, I probably get a right smile from Andy when I say this, it's not all about offsetting. Um, I think a lot of businesses out there, they, you know, we've seen a lot of partners have got their, sorry, a lot of operators have got their green partner now, you know, they, they will, they will, they will, they will continue as business as usual. They'll plant a bunch of trees and they'll pat themselves on the back and plaster it all over social media. And I think that offsetting, I've kind of quickly found out, is really the last thing you should be doing. It's really the very end of the process, i.e. make better supply chain choices across the entire board. And when you've done everything you can do to, to be as kind of green as you possibly could, you, you know, to use offsetting just to offset the little bit that's left, that, that's left rather than kind of, you know, offset bad behavior across your entire business so that's probably a big one for us and um and we we've kind of gone for it as well so we um we've committed to transparent carbon reporting scope one scope two scope three so um glenn my colleague's on holiday at the moment um i mean with with, with that kind of carbon reporting we had to look at things like every cup of costa coffee that one of our team has bought for a client over the course of the last year and a half i mean it's that level of detail so um you know make no mistake it's you know it's a lot of work um it, it's probably kind of a full-time job for one two three people depending on the size of the business but i'd say kind of go for it um i think as well i think uh with, with ours it's quite a complex company structure in terms of the owner ownership structure because we're part of a group and um i think we kind of figured that as, as a business we were kind of doing the right thing we, we know this little two two building operation impact working and then when B Corp started to unpick that we've got our shareholders have got um, common ownership of other businesses. So now they want to know what's happening over there and over here. So, you know, it became a little bit more kind of complicated. We've managed to pick our way through it. I mean, we, we couldn't have done it without Andy's help. So I'd say for the relatively low cost of using a B Corp consultant, no, very, very low cost, I'm say using a B Corp consultant, pick up the phone to someone like Andy because it will make your life a hell of a lot easier. And it's good for us to have someone we can kind of speak to along the way. Just all those little questions. And I'm sure we've asked loads of really dumb questions. Oh, yes, Andy, but um, we, we, we couldn't have done it without him. 
And, and just picking up on that point, perhaps with Andy, on the, the, the complex nature of your business, because I think that's, I had a conversation with an operator a few weeks ago who was who is on the B Core journey, but they they hit a, 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 a block really because another part of the business that is nothing to do with the workspace operation was going to find it really difficult to tick the boxes. And that was then a, a block for them. Have you a, any thoughts around this, Andy? Because I, I think a lot of our members are in a similar position. Yeah, it, it does happen, and uh, B Lab are obviously wanting to be robust with the types of companies that they are going to um, uh, B Corp, and they want to ultimately, for B Lab themselves, avoid any PR disasters by B Corp in a company, and it then goes public, and people are saying, "Well, why are you B Corp in those?" And there are, you know, one or two of those questions per year that get asked. Firstly, it's great that B Lab have got a, a solid process so that if someone within the community is felt to be doing stuff that they perhaps shouldn't be, there is a formal escalation process that B Lab have got. Uh, so there's no great surprises. And if someone gets reported in, then they are uh, properly investigated. So it's not a trial by social media, um, you know, right there out. Um, you know, you, every, everyone gets a, a fair crack of the whip. So that's one thing. Um, also, they've got a continually evolving standards committee that is a global standards committee. So I made mention in the presentation that there's a new standard that is going to be uh, published next year. So those standards are constantly evolving. You'll also get B Corp certified and then you'll recertify uh, every three years. So in the interim two years, you publish your own social and environmental impact report. And then if you like, teacher comes back to mark your homework on year three, that's essentially the way it goes. But some of the industries in that section six, the disclosure questions, the negative screening questions, there are some questions in there, which depending on how they're answered, might be showstoppers. Uh, you know, if 99% of your business is built around manufacturing weapons, then B Corp is probably not for you. Um, so, you know, we and, and other B Corps wouldn't want a company to be certified who is involved in that. And I know that that's an extreme example, but there are, are other examples that are looked at, you know, uh, military, um, uh, tobacco is one. You know, there's a few different industries in there which uh, the standards team are tightening up on. The other thing to say about group um, certification is generally speaking, B Lab would like to certify a whole group as one, roughly if they're up to a hundred million pound in turnover. So you might have five different entities of 10 million each, total 50 million. B Lab would ideally want to certify that whole group because of the sibling impacts that might, that might come out. If you're a super large corporate, you know, um, a Unilever, a Danone type thing, then you might have some of your um, entities that in and of themselves are a billion pounds each. So, you know, BLAP would, would certify those individual entities. But if you're part of a group, then generally speaking, BLAP would like you to uh, look at the implications of certifying in whole group. And if some of those uh, entities would find it more difficult to certify, it's worth having those conversations sooner rather than later, because if you are going to be derailed, you want to be derailed early on, not a year into the process when you've put a lot of work into that. Having said that, I would still 100% advocate that this framework as a free to use framework is a brilliant framework for any company to use. And look at the kind of uh, issues that B Corp will surface in terms of this de-risking. At least if you are one of the, you know, slightly dodgier industries, you can go through that. You can still do some things good. You can still, even if you might be environmentally dreadful, let's say, you can still look at it and use it as a framework to say, well, how are we looking after our people? And use it as a, uh, as a valid framework uh, for that. Why wouldn't you want to be uh, doing that to look after your people? Um, but whether you can actually get the B Corp uh, badge itself uh, is, is a debate that you need to go into. But generally speaking, I mean, Mark, question back to you. You know, going through this process, 
has made impact working a better, fitter, stronger, healthier business, full stop, with or without the B Corp badge, going through this journey has been a huge learning curve and it's helped you to plug some gaps. And then the cherry on top of the cake is the B Corp badge, but let's focus on the cake, which is the business. That's really what I think the value of this journey is. Yeah, I, I kind of agree. I mean, if I, you know, so we're in the, we're in the final stages now of our impact assessment. Um, for anyone who knows impact working, I'd encourage you to go and have a look at our website, see what, what our agenda looks like. Um, there's, there's a, you know, we've got a strong ESG focus. Um, most of our suppliers are B Corps. Uh, we've got a relatively small team, which um, one of them, Heather, is on the call. Hopefully we, we treat them well. Um, in terms of purchases that we kind of make, in terms of our furniture, our living walls, you know, they, they, you know they're as green as can be. We use green energy suppliers. Um, however, at the initial stage to submit for the, uh, for the assessment, we, we actually have achieved 86.4 points. Now, bear in mind, I think, Andy, does it go up to 160, something like that? And I think the, the, the cutoff, the bare minimum, is 80 points. So we were sort of sat there thinking, look, you know, looking at our competitors, thinking, you know, well, this is great business, we do everything kind of really well. Um, and, and even for a business like ours, we've, we've only kind of really just scraped past the pass mark. And it's given us a lot of things to kind of think about. Um, if I was to offer one bit of advice for people on the call is, um, and there was, um, I'm trying to think there was, there was kind of a conference, it actually might have been sort of a Flex, Flex SA kind of conference a while ago, sort of Jane, and there was a question posed to the panel about ESG standards uh, and uh, the three chaps on the, uh, on the panel, they, they wax lyrical about their environmental standards um, for sort of 10, 15 minutes. They made it all about kind of planting trees and no one on the panel actually spoke about S, social governance. And I think the thing that we've really learned is, and I think this is, goes for an industry as well, bear in mind we are a, we are a service provider, we are a people-based industry. This industry has a hell of a lot of work, work to do on S. And I'm talking in terms of raising employee standards, um, standards of living, closing the gender pay gap, you know, diversity and inclusion and inclusivity policies, that kind of stuff. I'd encourage any of our any of our competitors, however good it makes them, you know, they kind of may kind of overtake us, you know, kind of make, you know, if, if, if last year was the year of E, make this year the year of S. Oh, sorry, right, this year was the year of E, make next year the year of S, because I think in terms of social governance, we got a long way to go. And, and that was really it highlighted a few areas where we thought we were actually behaving pretty well and had had high standards. Um, touch wood, I mean, we've never lost a member of staff, so we're obviously going to do something right. However, you know, there's no, the, the, the onus is on us. Well, let's say the, the, the onus is on me to raise the game in terms of the quality environment that we provide for our people. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so, 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 and Andy, just to pick up, um, and we've got a few minutes left for questions. If anyone has any others, but we've had a question asking what the fees are to B Lab. Yeah, that is a uh, great question. So you can um, you can Google B Lab pricing, and you'll find that. But essentially, for a company, um, this I'm going to give some examples for a company up to a million pounds in turnover. The fee is 1500 pounds up to 5 million in turnover is two and a half thousand pounds up to 10 million in turnover is six thousand pounds and up to 20 million in turnover is twelve thousand pounds there's various other breaks across that but that will give you a uh, that will give you an indication as to the kind of size fee roughly there is when you hit submit, you'll also pay an initial £300 submission fee. Um, that's effectively to filter out the tire kickers and people that are not really that serious about it. But if you then subsequently post audit, get through and get your B Corp certification, you'll then get the invoice for that for that annual fee. And, and Mark noted that it would it's, it would be challenging if you're a, a large, well-established, long-established business to, to start on this journey than it is if you're a much um, you know, early days of, of your business. But obviously, people are where they are in, in that. So it, uh, that and other issues, is there a right or a wrong time to become a B Corp or seek to become a B Corp? 
No, I mean, I genuinely uh, think, you know, the right time is now. Uh, some people say, oh, we'll do it next year when we get a quieter moment. And we all know that a quieter moment just never comes along. Um, there are a couple of things to think through. The larger, more well-established businesses tend to have more process and policy in place, which is a useful thing. But if even if they think those are great, they then find that they need to change those larger businesses are slightly less flexible and making changes is sometimes a bit more onerous. Whereas on the other end, smaller businesses, smaller uh, startups and so on and so forth will be uh, devoid of a lot of process and policy, but much more nimble and flexible in terms of their decision making. So that's the two kind of um, general differences that we, we quite often see between smaller, newer companies and the bigger ones. The bigger ones think it's easier for the littler ones and the littler ones think it's easier for the bigger ones. Fact of the matter is it's not easy for anyone, but you know, if you follow a bit of a, a program and a process, you know, we say our, our 10 step, you know, we've got a, a 10 step couch to 5K program, which we will walk clients through across three months is broadly two hours a week across three months and that will get you started and help you get your head around what you need to do and come up with an action plan that doesn't mean you're audit ready you've got all of your uh, evidence in place that comes post the three month stage once you've hit submit and that's the stage that mark's been in uh, you know just getting prepped up ready for the final audit but but there's a sensible and a pragmatic way to getting started that doesn't need to hijack your whole business no matter what size you are and i'm sure it varies massively on the you know, on the basis of all the things you, you've just mentioned but is there a sort of average time it takes to achieve that end point or does it just vary yeah. massively? yeah so a year is the minimum you know you, you you spend about three three months getting prepped ready to hit submit there's then currently a circa six to nine month queue in the audit process. So, you know, generally speaking, it's minimum about a year. If you are absolutely brand, brand new and you're in your first year of training, trading, there's something called B Corp pending, which you can achieve uh, somewhat more quickly. Um, but you will then be recertified within a year post your first year startup. So, but generally speaking, uh, a year is the minimum. I have had clients that have taken, you know, 18 months because there's sometimes, you know, there's things that come up, they're doing a new launch or there's various different things that are happening. Key players, you know, might suddenly disappear off on, um, you know, leave. So there are, you know, there's, it, there's not, a, it's got to be that. But what we find is the more successful ones are the ones that have a regular time slot in their diary to just kind of keep up that momentum. And we'd say, two hours a week you won't do it on 20 minutes a week but equally it doesn't need to hijack you completely just put some time into it each week and you will move from a to b yeah so it's a manageable yeah. process and i was speaking to somebody earlier this morning and saying that that we had this webinar um from a workspace operator and she was saying that something they're looking at at the moment is getting furniture from um from a b corp business and would having seen your presentation now is the place to go to find out who that company might be the directory that you you highlighted yeah literally just go into that directory and in the keyword search you know put furniture and then see what comes up you can put accountancy in, you can put you know um toner cartridges in you can put all sorts of things in there stationary and you will get a range now you can then filter that down by country if that's helpful but yeah that that is exactly what people do use the um the b corp directory for the other thing is once you become a b corp there's something called the beehive which is almost like an internal knowledge base that is uh, useful so there's a lot of people that put shout outs uh, on the beehive to say hey you know we're looking for a um, health and well-being policy has anyone done some work on that and within an hour you know you've got uh, you know responses coming in from the rest of the community saying we've spent quite a lot of time here here's a copy of our process so so it's quite a kind of sharing community in terms of sharing best practice so that's uh, also also a really useful resource 
Great, and that's that's yeah. So you've got some net network of support there as well. Um, so Mark, perhaps just to, to finish with you um, on, on this, I think we're sort of draw, drawing to a close now. Um, if there was there anything that you'd now do differently on this, or do you feel it's is there any sort of lessons that you've learned that you think it'd be useful to, to pass on to others, or has it all gone great? Yeah, um, what would I do differently? Um, I think as a business, you know, we're, we're hugely indebted to Andy. So to say, you know, we, you know, we could have started the process of the slightly, slightly earlier, um, albeit we're still in our relative infancy. Um, as I say, for, you know, for, for me, the, the, the focus really has to be on social govern, governance for a lot of our businesses. And I don't know if Andy has a view on this, um, but my kind of view of, of the industry sort of holistically is actually looking at a lot of our competitors they've got a really tight green agenda. You know, they do a lot of good stuff. They make good supply chain choices. That should now be a minimum requirement. It's it's no longer newsworthy that you chose to use a renewable energy provider over, you know, a fossil fuels provider. That should be the bare minimum. I think, um, as I say, with the focus on sort of social governance, and there's things in there that, you know, for example, appointing a junior member of staff to the board, to, to you know, to hold the board to account, uh, making sure that the highest earner in your business can only earn X multiple of the most junior person in your business. You know, it's 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 all about kind of being sort of fair and open and honest. And, you know, I quite like the fact that B Corp leaves you, no, it leaves you nowhere to hide. You know, it's not fancy marketing kind of buzzwords. It's you have to do it. You have to believe in it. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's, you know, that's 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 the thing that we probably have enjoyed most about it. Um, and we've not been perfect in everywhere. So don't be too hard on yourself as well. We thought we were doing the right thing with certain areas. Transpires we were doing completely the wrong thing. But that's OK, as long as, you know, you kind of change it and you do something about it. So it, it's it's been, you know, it's, it's, it's been a really enjoyable journey for us. And our, our business definitely is in more robust health having left it. Um, can I can I promise that people will convert more sales or achieve higher death rates. No, I can't. But what I can say is there's definitely a handful of, operate, of, of occupiers in our building who've chosen us because our values align with their values. I, as a business, they had a focus on social governance and they had a focus on the environment. Well, you know, they were never going to choose us as their, you know, um, you know, as, as their operator. If we decided to, you know, decorate our meeting rooms with polar bear hides, you know, it's 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 one of those where, you know, you tend to birds of a feather flock together, you know. So it's, it's definitely helped us win a few clients that perhaps we, we wouldn't have done otherwise. I think. Yeah. Thank you. Any any final reflections on that, Andy? Uh, yeah, I think you know, just you know, Mark Mark was saying, you know, it's left them no place to hide. So there is something going through Parliament at the moment called the Better Business Act that is effectively going to require all companies, no matter what their size, age, shape, et cetera, to publish an annual social and environmental impact report. So there are the occasional criticisms that will come out in the press of companies that are B Corp, hey, look at them. And part of me thinks, relax about the B Corps. You know, they, they are 7,000 companies globally. They are 1,600 companies in the UK out of five million SMEs. So I think where we should be looking is what is happening, you know, with the 4,999,000 companies that are not being transparent, that are not being open, that are not necessarily measuring and improving their social and environmental impact. I think that legally, soon, every business will have to, uh, you know, be honest and transparent about that. And I think that there will be a lot of companies who currently are not following what, what they know is good practice that will be exposed. And um, I think it will be a really interesting time because a lot of companies will then be looking at uh, what they can do to try and uh, make it right. And, you know, if that leads to a lot more companies using the uh, B Impact Assessment Framework to measure and assess and potentially then get audited, then I think it will lead to the world being a better place and for businesses using their business as a force for good, not just for profit. And that's really our, our main aim is to encourage thousands, hundreds of thousands 
I, I read a book recently that said the tipping point for anything to actually start getting traction was 3%. Well, 3% of 5 million is about 150,000 businesses. So, you know, we're currently on 1,500. So we've got quite a way yet to get to anywhere close what the tipping point would be for the, you know, good ESG standards to come into play. And I think B Corp is, is an exemplar and is a leader in that. But we really do need to scale it and get it out to many, many more businesses. So it does become more business as usual that this is the way that companies act so um yeah I, I would leave everyone really on that note of encouragement but if that's not something you've done or you've looked at or considered get in touch you know it doesn't need to be as painful as you think it might be there is help out there and it is a thoroughly useful and inspirational and encouraging process to go through that's I've got um, Jen. Something yes, to add. Final, final word, Mark. <laughs> go for it, Mark. I'm oh, sorry. You're okay for me to go ahead? Yeah. Yeah. Um, my, my team, if they're on the call, will laugh at me for this because they say I never stop talking about our coffee. And I'm just trying to think kind of a good example I can kind of give people on the call. And we buy our coffee from a company called Amama, so a certified B Corp. And if anyone knows about the global coffee, coffee market, it's generally commoditized, it's controlled by a mess cafe. Their goal is to push the price of coffee down. Uh, which makes it more profitable and shock surprise surprise the farmer in sub-saharan africa is not paid enough for his coffee and he can't afford to send his kids to school and spend his whole life in abject poverty well with the marmots they could have buy directly from a cooperative farm which they have a direct relationship with in africa we pay a little bit more for our coffee um by about eight percent but it's really good quality coffee and we get good feedback from our occupiers the difference is the farmer has now paid a fair price for his coffee and he can now afford to spend to send his kids to school. Now that's just one basic um, supply chain choice where we, we, we could have done what everyone else did in the industry. We could have just kind of got, gone and found a wholesaler who just sold us, you know, Nest Cafe, you know, or whatever it is. But just through that one supply chain choice, um, don't underestimate the impact, the impact, the impact that you can have or the benefit you can have on other people. So you know, take it seriously. Yeah, no, you, and you know that you're making a positive difference to, um, through through your business, which is 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 what it's all about. Okay, thank, well, thank you hugely to Andy and Mark. I think that's been really, really useful. Lots of lots of information um, packed in. Um, and our next um, Flexible Space Association webinar is going to be something a bit different. Um, we're going to be marking International Men's Day with a webinar on the 15th of November looking at male mental health and suicide prevention. Um, further details of that are on our website, including the, the sign up for that. Um, we've also got other, other webinars and other in-person and online events um, in the planning at the moment. So do keep a look out on the um, events page of our website and for our, our members in, the, in our fortnightly newsletter. So um, thank you again to Andy and Mark and have a good rest of the day, everybody. Goodbye. Thanks very much. Bye.